It is the political story that continues to make headlines after the Prime Minister's special adviser, Dominic Cummings, told reporters yesterday that he didn't regret his controversial 260-mile trip to Durham at the height of the lockdown. He also claimed that he made an extra 60-mile round trip to check his eyesight was working. No, I don't, I don't regret um, what, what I did. As I, as I said, I think um, you know, reasonable people may well disagree. I think that what I did was actually reasonable in these, uh, um, in these circumstances. I have not offered to resign. Um, did you ever consider it? Did, no, I, did not, I have not considered it. Why did no one ever ask the question, why didn't Mrs Cummings drive the car? If his Your eyesight was, was faulty, would he not have sat in the passenger seat and she would have said, can you see that road sign? Can you see those lights ahead? How are you doing? Because I certainly know Mrs Holmes wouldn't have allowed me no. to be behind the wheel. She wouldn't allow me to be behind the wheel most days. But not if you said, my vision is impaired, my vision's blurred, I'm nervous about my vision. Why would you then get in the car? But anyway, that is the question. TV We're going to put to Nick Ferrari and Camilla Tomini very, very they shortly. Are. But first, we are joined by Tony Blair's former advisor, uh, Mr. Alistair Campbell, uh, for this one this morning. Alistair, I understand you're, you're you know, obviously very, very concerned. You're very angry ab about what you saw yesterday. You are very angry, particularly I'm following you on Twitter, Alistair. But it looks like he's going to survive this. I don't know whether he will or he won't. I mean, you know, the thing about what we're seeing with Boris Johnson as Prime Minister and those of us who've known him a long time worried that this would happen is the guy's not up to the job. He's incompetent, he's a liar, he's a charlatan, and all the rules are going out. All the norms and the rules that people, whether they're Labour or Tory or Nationalist or Green or Liberal Democrat or anything. Uh, when Mrs Thatcher was Prime Minister, I didn't like a lot of what she did, but I didn't feel ashamed that she was going around the world as my Prime Minister. I feel ashamed seeing these people in charge of our country. And it wouldn't matter so much, this hypocrisy and the lying and the story unravelling day in, day out. It wouldn't matter if the country felt that the government was actually on top of the crisis. Tens of thousands of people, tens of thousands, enough to fill Anfield Stadium, have died from this outbreak of COVID. In part, many of them, and I'll say this very directly, in part because of Boris Johnson's laziness at the start, his indifference at the start, and his and his ministers utter incompetence since. And now, with all these challenges facing the country, the entire government machine is being thrown behind, not saving the country, but saving Boris Johnson's pal. But but is, is that, isn't that what's making Steve. you really angry when you think about it? I mean, putting on your director of communications hat there, um, the, the thing is that um, Dominic Cummings, yesterday, by what he did, uh, may well have done really quite a good job of damping down this story. Well, I don't, I don't know how you work that one out, Eamon. I mean, it's the first time I can ever recall in any country in the world where an advisor, <clears throat> unelected, has done a press conference in the Rose Garden, which frankly is a bit like Monica Lewinsky telling her side of the story from the Oval Office. And afterwards, the Prime Minister goes out and says, well, I don't want to say anything that might, you know, upset Dominic, who's just spoken to you about this. And <clears throat> look, this is too serious just to be seen as a kind of game about, you know, whether the papers will let him survive and whether Johnson needs coming. This is at a time when the country is in a state of absolute crisis, a health crisis that is going to become an economic crisis. In a crisis, Eamon Ruth, you need a prime minister who is utterly focused on the challenges facing the country, who is on top... So, Alistair, of if, he, if, he, if it looks like he's losing the confidence of the public because mm -hmm. of this situation with Dominic Cummings, why won't he sack him? I don't know. I honestly don't know. And if he ever, you know, came out of his bunker and actually did a few interviews with people such as yourself and faced proper questioning... I mean, <clears throat> was it not a bit shameful yesterday that Cummings, an unelected advisor sits there and takes question after question from these journalists. And Boris Johnson sits with a mute button, and the minute it gets a bit tricky, he presses the mute button. I mean, this is Viktor Orban. This is Trumpism. Now, at least Trump has the balls to get out there and take a bit of, you know, scrutiny. At least Orban believes something. This guy doesn't believe anything. And, you know, all this... This is a right-wing cabal that won power in this country by pretending to be for the people against the elite. 
Do you remember all that? We're for the people, they're the elite. Look at them now. And even to this day, even this morning, you see these snivelling cabinet ministers with their cut and paste tweets. Oh, Dominic spoke, done what everybody Yeah, but if thought. you were directing communications there, would it have been any different? I mean, that's what you're going to get people yeah. saying to Standard you. This is pot calling now. kettle black here. How? Well, I'll tell you two things in answer to that. One, I would never have done what Cummings did. Two, if I had, I wouldn't have waited to be sacked. I wouldn't have waited to, for Tony Blair to tell me go. I'd have gone. Three, I remember, I've written this morning. I won't use what he said. I've written this morning about once when I phoned up Charles Clark and asked him to do something a bit daft, OK? I wanted him to dress up as Santa Claus for a photo call at Christmas, OK? His first word began with F and his second word began with F. <laughs> That's what these cabinet ministers should be saying to Dominic Cummings when he says, can you do a little tweet saying that I'm a lovely father? It's pathetic, Eamon. All right, was there anything that he wasn't asked yesterday that you would have asked him in that garden? Was there anything not put to him that needed to be put to him? Well, I think he needs to be pinned on why his version of events was so different to Boris Johnson's the day before. Johnson said that he'd had several hours of extensive face-to-face -face discussions with Cummings when he should have been focusing on this bloody crisis, several hours, and he said, he concluded that as they were both about to be incapacitated with coronavirus to get the childcare that they could only apparently get in Durham, even though when they got there, they didn't get it, by the way, he had to make that journey. That's what he said. That was directly contradicted by Cummings. Here's another thing I'd like to ask him. His wife, Mary Wakefield, spectator, part of this right-wing cabal, she wrote a piece directly in the spectator, directly contradicted on several points by what Cummings said yesterday. They're a bunch of liars and they're wriggling and they're making up as they go along. And honestly, Eamon, until this country wakes up to what sort of people we have put in power, we are in peril. And I did, I did a series of interviews with different media around the world last night. And I've written about these on the article website this morning. First question on Radio New Zealand. Mr. Campbell, we're watching your country with absolute incredulity as to what goes, what's going on. Irish radio, Pat Kenny, one of them, who you'll know, one of the most respected broadcasters in Ireland. One, he said Boris Johnson's got blood on his hands. Two, he said, what has Dominic Cummings got on Boris Johnson? French radio, can you explain to us why your country, which used to be respected in the world, is now communicating nothing but absolute chaos? I could go on and on and on. We are a global joke because of the person that we have put in prime in Downing Street. Um, to, to people who would say, and of course, um, you know, Mr Cummings denies he broke uh, guidelines. Uh, the government say that he didn't break those guidelines as well. We and a lot of people, so a lot of people, I mean, I was listening to a phone in with, with Nick Ferrari today, and, you know, a lot of people stand behind Mr Cummings. He convinced a lot of people. Um, we saw him, he was subdued, he was relatively humble in, in tone. Uh, maybe, if not in words, uh, hey, what would you say? Why is it important? People might be saying to you, let it go, Alistair. We're moving on. The agenda's moving on. Why is it important that the agenda doesn't move on? No, you're absolutely right. The agenda should move on. And we should have a prime minister and a cabinet who are properly and fully focused on the challenges facing the country, not keeping one man in Downing Street. I agree with you, we should move on. And honestly, Eamon, I know I've come on and I've said a few things and you've got to play devil's advocate a bit, but if that was humility, I'd hate to see arrogance. If that was contrition, I would hate to see what he was like when he was actually being... And this is the other thing about Cummings. We know, I mean, these people, do they not realise that if you're somebody like me, who worked in Downing Street for quite a long time and who worked very, very hard, to get on with the civil service and the people who worked in the diplomacy service and the people who worked in all the bits of government that you need for an efficient government. Do you not think that some of these people tell us what's going on in there? And it's not because they're disloyal, it's because they're exasperated. I've had civil servants, I wrote yesterday about this civil servant who said to me, Alistair, you keep saying how bad it is. You've got no idea. It's far worse than you think. These are dreadful people. They're 
absolutely unfit to be in office. But then, no. but, but then Alistair, a lot of people, whatever, whatever your political leanings, generally think that about politicians, I have to say, whichever party you support. And we're in unprecedented times. We're coping with something that we haven't had to deal with before. So I don't think people are... are that's not their concern. I think their concern is what they are being told to do by the government mm. and then one of the members of that government, the person who helped set this guideline, has seemed to have broken them, I even agree. though they say legally and re he acted legally and reasonably. I just want to tell you, a lot of our viewers agree with you about whether he should continue in his post. 81% of them say no at the moment. So, could I ask you, Alistair, um, do you think he breached guidelines despite what the government said or are you simply not buying his story? Well, both. He, look, he breached the guidelines. And listen, I've heard you guys talking before on your programme about issues of child, child welfare and domestic violence. Do people understand that the clause in the coronavirus bill that he is using as his defence for these so-called exceptional circumstances that made him have to go to Durham, that clause is there to protect children at the risk of abuse and women in particular at the risk of violence. That is how venal this is. And so I just think we've, we've got to kind of move on. Let's Please stop asking me to try and say what I think a way might be to justify what they've done and said, because there is no way. He, I'll give you another one, Eamon. Um, this thing about, about security, I was looking through last night. My, my daughter, she was five at the time of the Good Friday Agreement, OK? After the Good Friday Agreement, um, you, you'll remember, quite a lot of dissident Republicans weren't very happy. And the people around Tony Blair, myself and Jonathan Powell and one or two others, the threat level was judged to be growing. And so we had all sorts of stun, stuff done to the House and all sorts of stuff done to our security. And then at Iraq, during the time of the Iraq, we had pr protests outside the House, day and night. And my daughter by then would be nine, the boys would be in their early teens, having to go out through that every single morning. Did we think about moving house? No, because you've got this thing, you've got this thing called the central unit who look after the security of people who work for prime ministers. Dominic Cummings will have access to that. And if he had genuine security concerns, as opposed to making them up yesterday to try and get himself out of a hole, I've written to the Metropolitan Police to ask if he's ever raised those security concerns with the central unit in recent weeks and months. And Alistair, Campbell, thank you, Alistair, for that insight. Really appreciate your time and your insight. Alistair Campbell, former Director of Communications at Number 10 Downing Street, thank you very much indeed. Let's go to Camilla Tomini and Nick Ferrari now on this. Uh, Camilla, I just wondered, had you anything to counter or, or, or add to what Alistair has just said? The thing is, though, Alistair, understandably, is making it a kind of ideological war between left and right. And there are some who are making it a war between Brexit and Remain. But actually, for most people, and I think including this morning viewers, this is about right and wrong. And some people will have seen the press conference and sympathised with Dominic Cummings and understood the reasonable nature of what he did for his wife and child. Whereas others will think that regardless of some of the incorrect facts that have been denied by Cummings, he's saying that part of the story isn't true, the idea that he returned to Durham afterwards. Even despite that, the original breach was a breach and it did show that it was one rule for them and another rule for the rest of us. So this is now about it becoming a huge distraction. The fact that you're dedicating this time to it on this show shows that it's still being discussed where the actual affairs of state, what Boris Johnson is suggesting about the lifting of the restrictions, and I know we're going to get onto that, but yeah. that's now... But, but no, 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 I, I, no Camilla, I think, it, I think it's more than that. If you feel you're being taken as a fool, if you think you're being oh. deliberately lied to, then people get really angry about that. Don't treat me as a <laughs> fool, people are saying. And Camilla, I'll ask you this. If, if Mr Tomini uh, said, I've got real trouble with my eyesight, I'd like to bring you out in the car with our child in the back and drive, let me ask you, would you say, sit in the passenger seat or I'm cool for you to drive a 60-mile return journey? No, of course I wouldn't want him to drive in that situation. And also, it does seem suspicious because they appear to have gone to Barnard so, Castle on his wife's birthday, right? Yeah, so what I'm saying is that doesn't sound believable. Nick, over to you. 
Well, I was listening to your interview with Alistair Campbell and is this the same Alistair Campbell who worked so hard with Tony Blair? Because while I accept the look of the UK PLC is not that rosy, there are a lot of people who had reservations about something called the Iraq War, which, of course, as Tony Blair led us into, and the communications director, one of whom on the days of 9-11 said it was a good day to bury bad news. So I understand Alistair's position and I respect his position, but you could point at all governments. Now, if we look at the Dominic Cummings case now, uh, it has taken up too much time. I agree with Alistair on that, but the key is... When we move to, and remember, as of Monday, we are meant to have, according to Boris Johnson, a world-beating track and trace system. A world-beating. That will only work if the people respect and adhere to it. And this is, I think, the greatest concern here. Well, this and is the thing, isn't it? It's the, the it's the Cummings effect now, because they're saying a lot of people have lost respect for the government, for the guidelines, really? for the lockdown, and saying, well, if yes. he just can get in his car and drive off or go off to a beauty spot for the day, then to hell with this, we're going out too, as we saw from all the footage on the beaches and parks yesterday. And we're looking to open some shops as of next week and more shops as of June 15. The only way this works is if we do buy into it and if we do track and trace. And if the Cummings affair has dented that, then we're in real problem. That, to me, is the key of where we find ourselves now. Well, Boris Johnson did announce, Camilla, yesterday that, that non-essential retailers will be able to reopen in England from the 15th of June. Um, is this some, and, and maybe introducing wider social bubbles of 10. Now, there are people now saying, hang on a minute, so I can go to the shop, I could go to a car showroom, but I can't bring my friends into my garden, or definitely not at the moment, only you know, one person in, in the park. People, again, are thinking, this doesn't make sense, the two don't kind of match up. Well, I think there's a to make sure that people can maybe gather outside. There's clearly huge concerns about too many people being inside because the virus spreads much more virulently in that circumstance. They're talking about maybe people being allowed to have barbecues and outdoor parties towards the end of June. And of course, that will be welcome. That's what everybody wants. But what I think is interesting now about the phasing, and clearly Boris Johnson was making those announcements yesterday because he wants to move the narrative on from Cummings. We're going to see a bit of a step change anyway because we're in half term right now, but from June the 1st, obviously, there are children going back. Then we see in the next couple of weeks this idea of non-essential retail opening. So certainly the lockdown is going to be loosening. What remains to be seen, though, is the public adherence to it. We've seen some yeah. polling this morning suggesting that the government approval rating's gone down and people are less worried about coronavirus than we were. And actually, if you go out and about on your allowed exercise, you can see people not necessarily flouting the rules, but there is a sense of returning to normality. Having said that, when you look at the econ economic damage, that perhaps hasn't come a moment too soon. OK, so well, well, I'd, I'd, like, I'd, like, I'd like to bring Nick in there, Camilla, because Mr Ferrari, um, on his show, he's, um, he's vehement uh, about this whole idea that we've got to get the country uh, back to work because... We are go well, we're not going bust. We are bust as a result of all of this. And like it or not, Nick, you were pointing out there are some people being paid 80% of their salary to sit on the beach. And the weather's been pretty good, and do they want to come back to work? And that is a genuine concern within government circles that these people, they don't have to necessarily pay their rail fares or their bus fares or whatever it might be, pay to park or whatever, and they're still getting 80% of their salary. To put it in context for your uh, viewers, Amy and Ruth, we are £300 billion in the hole. That is twice the annual budget of the National Health Service. We've borrowed enough to run the NHS for two years. I'm not saying that's wrong. It has saved lives, but now we have got to to get back to work. Otherwise, the toll that we take, emotional damage, alcoholism, whatever else it yeah. might be, will be vast. We've got to get back even though that may risk lives. I don't think it need risks lives if we have a good track and trace. If we say that, if you're vulnerable, if you're over 70, if you have a pre-existing health condition, you are not expected to come back to work. But there are the, the number of people who've contracted this disease under 40 and who've died is vanishingly thin. Those people, providing they don't live with grandma, should be offered the opportunity to get back to work. Guys, appreciate hey, thank that. You. Thank you very much Camilla, indeed. Very After much. that clarion call there from Nick Ferrari and Camilla Tomini, thank you very much indeed.